Welcome back, you found Fritz. Today's video represents the fourth part in the first installment of my debut creative series. Focusing on the do-it-yourself musician and the home recording studio enthusiast, so far we've covered the writing and the production process for the drums, the bass, the guitars, and the vocals from the first song in this series called To the Moon in a Hurricane. This video is all about the mixing phase of the production. If you find this video useful or entertaining, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more stuff. And as always, you can find the links to the products that I discuss in this video in the description below. Thank you very much and let's jump right in. One of the biggest challenges facing musicians today who mix their own music is the ability to maintain focus and to know when to put the mix aside, call it finished and move on. Aside from wanting to go back and add some things or re-record some parts, there's the inevitability that the more time you spend mixing, the better you're gonna get at it. And of course, you'll wanna try new techniques. Also, there's always going to be this brand new shiny plugin or virtual instrument coming out, which can derail your progress because it promises to be the most game-changing tool that you just can't finish your song without. However, at the same time, the more time you spend mixing the same song, the more likely you are to lose that initial connection to it. And you may find yourself too focused on the minutia of the sonics, and more than likely, you'll see diminishing returns to the final production to the point that only you will ever notice them. If you can accept where you are skill-wise in the moment and use the tools you have, then that will allow you to move on and do what matters most, which is of course to write your next song. Because isn't that creative energy after all what made you want to pick up a guitar or another instrument or write down some lyrics in the first place? My guess is that the intention was not to be finicking around with frequencies all day long. Now, all this being said, I'll be the first to say that I love to try new plugins, especially the ones that emulate the old hardware from the days of the big recording studios and the classic albums. Simply put, the way that rock or alternative or indie or many other styles of music sounds best is with subtle amounts of harmonic distortion in the signal that you get from different stages of the recording chain. And today's modern digital interfaces typically have none of that. So we have these plugins that have evolved over the last 15 years or so that attempt to inject some of that old soul back into the signal. I'll focus on a few of the ones that I used in this song, as well as some more modern plugins that can tackle problems in a way that the old hardware emulations can't. So with that, let's jump into Logic and I'll do my best to explain the choices that I've made for this mix. Okay, so now that I've cleaned up everything a little bit, the first thing I'm gonna do is just walk you through what I have here track-wise. So I've got three kick drum mics, three snare drum mics, and these are all the printed tracks from Superior Drummer 3 that I've converted to audio tracks. Then I have a sum of all three snare mics that I've parallel compressed and I called it snare crush. Then I have the hi-hat, an overhead, a mono overhead. So I have a stereo overhead and a mono overhead. Rack tom, floor tom, a mono ambiance mic, a far ambiance mic, and what I did with the ambiance mics is I've separated them between the verse and the chorus because I processed them differently. Then I have something called back bus, which is a parallel compression of all of the microphones on the drum set. So usually if I was compressing all of the drum tracks together on a separate parallel bus, I would have that set up in logic. But since Superior Drummer already did that for me and it sounds really good, I'm just gonna use that. Then I have my direct bass guitar. And again, I separated this between the verse and the chorus because I, because I processed it slightly differently. And I even processed it slightly differently when all you can hear is a guitar and the bass by itself. So I separated these on three tracks. Then I have my clean guitar, which plays in everything except for the choruses. After that, I have the three guitars, which you can hear in the intro of the song, as well as before the second verse and sparsely in a couple of other parts. And those are grouped together with their own output. <laughs> 
After that, I have what I call my drone guitars, which I just called Butte because they sound beautiful. <laughs> and those are heard on the verses. Then I just have what I call the pre-chorus swells. And you can hear these at the end of the verses going into the pre-chorus. And this is the ebo. Then I have what I call the two who guitars because this part reminded me of the who. And those are heard on the chorus. And then I have the tremolo guitar, which is played up the middle. This guitar before it is actually only heard. It's barely heard. It's more of a feeling. And that's played in the middle eight and at the very last outro of the song, as well as just a few notes here and there. And like I said, this is sort of like a feeling. It's like a shade. It's not really heard too loudly in the mix. I might actually turn that up a tiny bit. <laughs> so then I have the tremolo guitar that you can hear in the choruses. And at points, this is almost a shade, like a, like a shade, like a feeling as well. And at other points, it's automated volume wise so that it pokes out a tiny bit more. And then at the end, I turned the eighth note tremolo into a 16th note and I panned it hard left and right. So you get some stereo effects. Then after that, I have my vocal effects, which I actually printed to save on processing power. In the verse, I used a combination of two different reverbs. And I wasn't trying to be smart here or something. That's just how it ended up. So that was a combination of a digital reverb and an emulation of an analog plate. And on the plate reverb, I did not print that. I just ended up using audio gritter, which takes the processing off of my main computer and puts it onto my server computer, which is strictly used to process plugins. And this is a relatively new emulation of an EMT 240 plate. And it's an add-on library for Acoustica Audio's Silver, which is like a host for different reverb algorithms and samplings. So I combined that with another library from Silver. And this is, I think it's an emulation of a Lexicon 220 or 240. I, I forget exactly which one, but this is a digital emulation. So that in combination with the plate ended up sounding pretty cool. And since this is the verse of the song and things are nice and open and there's some space to play with, I left a longer tail on the reverb because there's not a lot of other elements to get in the way of it or it to get in the way of. So after those two reverbs, I have a printed Dimension D, which is sort of like a spatial widener plugin. And this is an emulation of the Roland Dimension D. Uh, this is made by Archuria. And it had a nice preset in it called What Your Vocals Need. And in this case, it was. Of course, I made it 100% wet because I have it on a send track. And I've actually used the hardware of this. And this preset made sense because all, all I used to do while using the hardware was push in number three. And that's, a, <laughs> and that's exactly how it's set here. And in solo mode, you can really hear what this one does to the track. Lens blurred on an empty night. It almost pans like a chorus to the sides. So it widens the vocal really nicely. So after my printed effects, I have my two vocals. And this is just the same part sung twice. So it's a doubled vocal. And the main one I have turned up a lot more than the double. So there's some tiny automation going on. But as you can see, I have the main lead about 15 decibels louder than the double. So here's what the dry vocal sounds like. Lens blurred on an empty night. Then with the dimension D, you'll hear that it gets wider. 
Lens blurred on an empty night. And finally, when I add in my two reverbs, this is what it sounds like. Lens blurred on an empty night. And in context with a track, I think that makes a nice little home for it. Lens blurred on an empty night. So I should note that on the reverbs and the dimension D, I rolled off a lot of low end. I used an EQ after the reverb. And as you can see on the plate reverb, I rolled off all the way up to 280. Then when I was doing the digital reverb, I did this, which really dramatically changed the sound of it. Oftentimes reverb by itself sounds too rich and it muddies up a lot of what's going on with the details of the vocals. So as you can hear, I made some dramatic changes to the digital reverb especially. So here's what it sounds like without what I did. Now that's the completely wet reverb signal. And this is how it sounds after I applied the EQ. It makes it a lot smaller and more focused. And I'm not gonna get into why I chose these cuts. It just made sense to do so while listening back in context with the rest of the track. So getting into the processing on the lead vocals, I gotta unfreeze these tracks. As you can see, Usually when I'm done with a mix, I end up with a lot of frozen tracks, if not all of them being frozen. So it, it, the way you can tell a track is frozen in Logic is that it's sort of grayed out. And then when you hover over it, you can see what it looks like normally. But yeah, every track is frozen. And this way of working does take some getting used to because it's like taking two steps forward and one step back. But... I use a lot of CPU intensive plugins, like a lot of the Acoustica Audio stuff is really CPU intensive. I even have the uh, I even have the separate computers set up just to process plugins in the same way that UAD has their extension boxes and their add-on cards and whatever. I've basically set up an entire computer just to process Acoustica Audio stuff and I still need to freeze. So how do you mix a song that's just full of frozen tracks? So like I said, working this way can be like taking a two step forward, one step back approach because you wanna mix while you're hearing everything as much as possible and just solo specific tracks when you're, when you're trying to fix like a muddy situation or you wanna make sure that you're not overly distorting a track or something like that. So basically the way that I've learned to work around is that I'll get a track to a certain point and then I'll freeze it and then continue mixing with everything playing. And then once I, once I run out of CPU headroom, once I start getting errors and the DAW just won't play back anymore, then I'll choose the tracks that I wanna freeze, free up some headroom, keep working. And then maybe you get to a certain point where everything sounds pretty good. And then you go back and unfreeze tracks that you wanna work on further and you just keep doing that until you're done. And of course, printing buses helps in this regard also. So let me unfreeze this lead vocal and I'll get into why I chose to do some of the processing on this. So as I mentioned before, I sang too close to the mic on the verses on this song, but I really liked the performance and I know that I have the tools to deal with that kind of thing. So I just left it the way it was. And first in line, I took a big, chunk out of like the 250 area to, th to 300. And then I also used a gentle high pass filter all the way up to 365 Hertz. And as you can see, the slope is just set to six. So that's the lowest you can choose. So that's dealing with a lot of that proximity effect that I created from singing too close to the mic. This is my favorite digital EQ, but you definitely don't need it. This is made by DMG. It's called Equilibrium. And the reason why I like it is it has a lot of different options as far as the curves you can make and the algorithms that you can choose to utilize while mixing. I'm not gonna get into them on this video because it would take a full video just to explain all of them. But once you dive into what the different options are, you can see that it makes a pretty good choice when it comes to digital EQing. So after that, after I cleaned up all that mud, I had a usable signal to push into the rest of my plugin chain. So here's what it, here's what the original vocal sounded like without this EQ. Lens blurred on an empty night. It's just way too thick, too creamy. Lens blurred on an empty night. That gave me a much better starting point. 
So after that EQ, I just have a preamp emulation. And even though the preamp that I used to record with was really good, I find that mixing and matching preamps in the box as well can add some cool textures. Lens blurred on an empty night. And admittedly, you might need mixing headphones to be able to hear that difference, but it just tames the harshness a little bit. And then from there, I'm going into a tape emulation. And before that, I have a meter plugin, making sure that I'm not pushing too much level into the tape, which would cause some artifacts that nobody wants to hear. So I have a Doro meter made by Waves going into this tape emulation, which is a library that's available for Acoustica Audio Nebula. And this is relatively new to the market, and it's definitely one of the truest tape emulations that I've heard. And it's made by London Acoustics, and it's called Taipei. And I think I'm pronouncing that right. But anyways, what it likes to see as far as l incoming signal is it likes to see the, the level not increase above these three bars too often. It can go to negative 16, negative 15 sometimes periodically, but it likes to see an average level between these three bars. Lens blurred on an empty night. As you can see, I have it calibrated pretty good. The peaks you're going to see around negative six, negative five, it can go all the way up to negative one before it clips. And then you don't want that. Or maybe you do. If it sounds good, do it. <laughs> but this plugin is very sensitive to the level that it likes to see. So usually what I do is I make sure that after I'm done processing with a plugin, the level is maintained because most of the plugins that I use like to see that negative 18 average with a peak level of around negative six to negative five, because they're all modeled on analog gear that used that standard. So even though we're in the digital world, that standard is maintained. So after that tape machine, I have an emulation of an analog EQ, and this is a Poltec emulation. And this is providing broad boosts that add something to the sound that a digital plugin just can't match. On the digital plugins, you can get a lot more precise like I did here. This curve would be really difficult to make with an analog EQ. However, the little sparkle and magic dust that this plugin adds to the sound is pretty much impossible to get with a digital EQ. And as you'll notice, most of my plugins just say A Gritter, and that's because they're being processed with my server computer running Audio Gritter. After that, I have a plugin that I've used on almost all of my audio tracks, and this is an emulation of the Neve console at Blackbird Studios. And this is also a relatively new plugin. Well, version two just came out. And what this does is it emulates the channel strip of a Neve console and specifically the one in Blackbird. And the reason why I used this on pretty much every channel to shape the sound of the mix is to give all of the elements of the song some cohesion. And even though I didn't use the preamp emulation on the lead vocal, I did on a lot of the tracks. And what I've noticed about this plugin in particular, because there's a lot of Neve emulations out there at this point, but this one in particular does a really good job of emulating the saturation or distortion that you get from pushing an audio signal into a preamp. So since I didn't really use that plugin too much on the lead vocal, let's just quickly jump into the ambiance mic on the drum kit to demonstrate how good the saturation can be uh, with, with this plugin. So here I have it set up to distort the, the room mic on the drum kit. And I have it set up so that when I adjust this knob, the volume changes as well to compensate for the level. So here's how it sounded without any of the added preamp saturation. And here's with it. It gives that explosive drum sound that I really like to use on those room mics and the choruses. And for those of you who are new out there, that type of preamp saturation used to be really hard to get inside the computer without doing a bunch of plug-in gymnastics. The easiest way to get that kind of distortion in the past was to send the signal out and do it in the analog realm and then back into the computer. But in the past few years or so, the technology has gotten a lot better. 
Now, I just cranked the room mic so that you can hear it in the mix better. So that was without that added excitement that the preamp saturation can add. Sounds more exciting to me. Okay, so next in line in the vocal chain, we have an emulation of an SSL console line input. This is also made by Acoustica Audio. And you might be asking yourself, why are you using two separate console emulations? You're using a Neve and an SSL. Well, back in the day, it was common practice to record onto a Neve and then mix on an SSL. I have loosely mimicked that process here, and it's not as some sort of academic practice, but it's because it actually helps me achieve the sound that I'm going after, which for this track is somewhere in the realm of late 70s to early 90s alternative or college rock, whatever you want to call it. Now, admittedly, this plugin by itself doesn't sound like much. However, as you can see, it goes from one to 32. So that's, that's an emulation of every single different line input from an SSLG console. Therefore, I have it on literally every track. And you can kind of describe that sound like this. It tightens up the signal and the SSLs are known for almost being on the brink of distortion without actually noticeably distorting. And again, you don't have to use the Acoustica Audio stuff because I get it, it's really CPU intensive. There's emulations by, you know, Slate Digital does a good one, UAD. I mean, there's a ton. There's Satson, Sonomous, I think they're called. There's a ton out there. But to my ears, the Acoustica Audio stuff really works well. And I've bought a lot of their plugins, so I get some pretty decent discounts. <laughs> so the cumulative effect of adding the Neve emulation and the SSL emulation on every, on every channel, it does a good job of providing that acoustic stamp that you would get from running everything through uh, actual console. So after that, I have a compressor on the lead vocal, and this is an emulation of, I think it's the Gates Stay Level, which, which is a very famous compressor for vocals and bass and other stuff. And this is working pretty hard, I think. Lens blurred on an empty night. Yeah, it's pushing it down roughly between 10 to 15, sometimes even 20 decibels of compression which is not uncommon for this unit because it sounds awesome. Here's with it out. Lens blurred on an empty night. And here's with it in. Lens blurred on an empty night. I know out of context, it's kind of difficult to tell, but it actually helps, but it actually saves me from doing a lot of little tiny automation moves, having to constantly ride the volume. It does a good job of leveling the vocal out. Now, if you've got some trained ears out there, you might've heard that the vocal is pretty sibilant. So to deal with that sibilance, I have two de after my compressor, because sometimes I've noticed that if you add a de before the compressor, you might just have to de again. So I usually put it afterwards. The first one is taking away 2000 kilohertz, which is a trick that I picked up from Billy Decker, I read an article where he does that on every single song. And after I tried it myself, I could not unhear it. So that's what I do. And after that, I have the Fab Filter Pro DS, which is DSing what you would more typically consider to be the frequencies that a DSer should be attenuating. So here's without those. Lens blurred on an empty night. Now listen to those T's and that S on lens. Lens blurred on an empty night. So you can see they go away pretty substantially. Some people might say it's too much, but when it's combined with a double track, those S's and T's are amplified even more. So I found it's completely song dependent how much you DS. You basically just want to DS until it sounds like you're singing with a lisp. Lisp and then back off a little bit to bring some of that S and that T back. Although sometimes you might notice that the de doesn't do the job you're looking for. And then you got to get in there 
and automate the volume as well. So as you can see on this S, I had to take the signal down an additional three decibels because it was still sticking out too much. So after the DSers, what I usually do is I'll put back in a little of that top end of the vocal, what can be called the air region, which is like 12K plus. And to do that, I used the companion of the compressor plugin from the same series of plugins that Acoustica released called Smoke. And this has a nice little shine on the top. This almost acts in the same manner as a Pultec does, but they just sound different from each other. So as you can see, I, I set this one all the way up to 16 kilohertz and I boosted pretty substantially. Not, not, I didn't go crazy, but I boosted so you could hear it. And that's all this one is doing. So here's without it. Lens blurred on an empty night. And here's with it. Lens blurred on an empty night. Hefts it right up and brightens it a little bit. When you're using analog emulations, sometimes you'll notice that they end up putting back in some unwanted low energy. So at the end of the chain, I put another high pass filter in this little dip to deal with that. So as you, so as you can see, I pretty much have all the same, I got all the same plugins going on in the chorus, but I got the preamp turned up just a little bit on the Neve. Plus I'm taking down some harshness that you can get from the vocals that builds up in the in this area, 3.3 kilohertz, which is a perfect frequency to choose. So in the chorus section, I have a bounced print of a reverb also. This is a different reverb from the verse. So let's ignore the print for now and go back to the original source. And what I did was I put a gate on it, which really cleaned up the signal because I had a lot of headphone bleed and some other stuff coming through. And then I actually DS'd the reverb, basically removing all the S's and the T's. And from there, I sent it to my Valhalla delay. I actually put a little bit of delay before the reverb, before it went to the reverb. And the reverb that I used is the same digital model from Acoustica Audio, but the time is shorter. The reverb tail, the length is shorter. So then after the reverb, I have a, another DMG taking off a lot of that low end. And here's what the reverb ended up sounding like in the chorus. That leads through the maze and out of sight. So you can hear those delays at the end. It's not a straight tail of reverb. So in the chorus, I was going to continue with the Roland Dimension D stereo effect, but it was just too clean on its own. So here's that. I ended up combining it with the Waves Real ADT. And this effect was made famous at Abbey Road Studios. The Beatles used it. And what you would do is you would have two tape machines going at the same time and you would changed the speed that they were playing back at and it created this cool stereo effect and you can distort this one as well so this is the effect of that combined with some eq and i ds'd it as well but the main plugins are the adt and the dimension d combined that leaps through the maze and out of sight now you might be able to hear why I added this DSer because it got pretty, pretty nasty, but it gave me some cool distortion effects as well as the stereo effects that I was looking for. We're on a first class train to the moon in a hurricane. So going further down, we have our background vocals. And basically what I did was, is I took all of these background vocal tracks, sent them to their own bus and processed them heavily and then bounced them down to a single stereo track. So I wanted the background vocals to really stand out and sound kind of otherworldly. So not only did I add, you know, the standard tape machine and the console plugins, but I also added the stereo effects that you get from the Dimension D and another cool device that Archeria did a really cool model of. I forgot exactly what this one was called, but it was used a lot in the 80s, I wanna say, and it's a flanger. So here's what all of the effects off, the flanger, the Dimension D. Out of sight. So you can hear that there's a lot of different voices, but they're all right up the center 
And then when you add in the flanger, out of sight. You can hear what that does. It spreads it out, adds some interesting movement. And then in combination with the Dimension D, out of sight. Really adds some cool stereo effects. So on top of the heavy handed chorusing and flanging effects, I have my standard DSers and compressors in the chain, as well as a preamp emulation, just adding some extra color. And again, at the end, I included another EQ, taking even more low end out. So here's the dry background vocal. And comparing these two isn't really fair, but you can see how, how much of a difference the amount of processing I did makes. Out of sight. And then after all of the compressors, the chorusing, the stereo effects. Out of sight. Huge difference. Okay, so to avoid repeating myself, I just have some more background vocals down here. And then the middle eight vocals I separated from the rest of them. But they're all pretty much doing the same amount or similar processing. And as far as going through each individual track and showing the EQ moves and just little things that I did on every track, I'm not sure how much it's really going to add to this video. If this is something you want to see on every breakdown of a mix I do, I'll do it. But the reason why I'm going to exclude it for now is not only because it's going to make a really long video, but your source material is undoubtedly going to be different than mine. And on tracks like the vocals in particular, I figured I'd break those down because on videos that typically break down mixes, you're going to have perfect sounding source material that an engineer labored over because they knew it was going to go to a high level mix engineer. When you're doing stuff by yourself, you're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. And I figured I would highlight some of them in this video. So with that in mind, I'm going to go over to the bass guitar. The mistake that I made with the bass is I recorded it too dark for what the song really wanted. Since I built this song in the studio, I didn't anticipate wanting a very bright bass, which in the end is what I was looking for. And I thought that that bass line would almost be like hip hop style where it didn't need a lot of top end. But in the end, I just couldn't hear it well enough. So here's what I ended up doing to compensate for that. So first, this is what I would do on every bass track, regardless of whether or not it was recorded properly or not. I have a digital EQ. And the reason why I use a digital EQ right off the bat is because I can really hone in on the frequencies that I need to attenuate or turn down. And I can really position where I want my high pass filter. Sometimes I don't even use one. On this song, setting it at 32 hertz just took away the unneeded air on the very bottom of the frequency spectrum. All it was doing was taking away from the headroom of the rest of the track. Because you remember, in the end, all of these audio tracks are eventually going to go to a stereo out. And having a lot of unneeded low frequencies is really going to choke the headroom that you get on that final stereo out. So back to the bass, I did some minor cuts on these low bands. And what these represent are boomy notes on the bass guitar, notes that were just way louder than other ones. So turning these down a little bit at the beginning of the chain prevented these notes from hitting the compressor too hard later on in the chain. So after this digital EQ, I have an Acoustica Audio Nebula library, which mimics a harmonic exciter. And now what this does is it just accentuates the higher frequencies. There's a lot of plug-in versions of uh, harmonic exciters. You have them inside of your DAW. Um, I know Plugin Alliance makes some nice ones. I think there's a ton out there. But since I'm an Acoustica Audio guy, I used a Nebula library. So after my harmonic exciter, I have my Neve channel strip, just adding a little bit of saturation with that nice preamp, some a little bit of top end, not too much. This 220 band on this EQ is really good for taking away mud. And when I say mud, I mean frequencies that interfere with pretty much every other element 
in the mix. And that's pretty much all this plugin is doing. So after that, I have my SSL emulation. Then here's where I really jack up the 1.5 kilohertz area. That's where you're gonna get your definition from that bass guitar. And in this case, I wanted to choose a plugin that was gonna add some harmonic distortion to the signal to thicken it up as well as make it more intelligible. So I chose the Smoke EQ again. And as you can see, I have it set to 1.5 kilohertz. I boosted it a lot. Then I also added a low pass filter at five kilohertz, taking away the excessive high end that you just don't need at all ever in a bass guitar. Well, never say never, I know. <laughs> After that, I have my compressor. So let's check in on how this is sounding. So here's without all of the new additions. And here's with my Neve, the SSL, the EQ, jacking up the 1.5 kilohertz area and the compressor. Sounds a little nosy, a little bit too weak. It's okay, we're not finished. Next, I have another compressor acting in conjunction with the first one. The first one's doing a really good at leveling the bass, making it nice and even. The second one is just chopping off some unneeded transients. So you can see I have the threshold set pretty high and the, the attack and release very fast. And this is um, a compressor made by the same company that makes the Neve plugin. And that's kit plugins, obviously. And now it, this is compressing so little that it's not even really registering on the gain reduction meter here. So it's just something you got to listen for. You got to listen for when a transient's coming out, coming out too strong, that tick that you don't want because it's annoying. So you just chop it off with another compressor going really quick. So after that, that's where I'm, this is where I'm boosting my low end because I didn't want to excessively push low frequencies into that compressor. So I'm adding them after the fact. So I have a second Neve console plugin. This is using no mic preamp at all. It's just going, so you set it to line input, not mic input. And this is where I'm adding my low end as well as some mid range at 560. And again, the amount of upper mid range higher frequencies that you add to a bass guitar are completely dependent on the song and the mix. So then after that, I have a meter plugin, just making sure that I'm staying within my range, which in Acoustica Audio World is a negative 18 average with peaks around six or five. And this is going into the tape machine emulation. Then I'm adding a touch, a very small amount of sub frequencies. You can see the wet signal of this plugin is just set to 4%. So I'm adding just a little bit of low energy. And I actually love this plugin. It's made by Waves and it's called Submarine. Then after that, I have a Pro Q3. And what separates the Pro Q3, the Fab Filter Pro Q3 from the DMG equilibri equilibrium is the Pro Q3 is capable of doing dynamic bands. For instance, here I have this set up so that every time the kick drum hits, this region is ducked down. And this is a feature that's unavailable on the equilibrium. So as you can see, I have my side chain up here set to a, my kick drum. And every time that kick drum hits, the bass is gonna sit back in volume a little bit to allow that kick drum to really poke through. So here's what's going on there. Let's get that kick drum in with it. This is something that I'll do on almost every song. Okay, so this might seem like a lot of plugins, but you gotta do what serves the song. And in this case, this is the route that I ended up going down. Okay, so we've discussed two big problems that I uncovered while mixing this song. A vocal that was recorded a little less than immaculate and a bass guitar that was recorded too dark. Again, I don't see a point in getting into every little tiny decision I made on an EQ or a compressor, because again, your source material is gonna be a lot different than mine. 
I just chose to expose some of the things that needed a lot of work in my case. So with that in mind, I'm just going to end this video off explaining the choices that I've made for the mix bus where every single audio channel is fed before it gets bounced down to a stereo track. So these three buses that I have selected marked trim, mix, and out. These three tracks are always there on any mix that I do, any song that I make. First, all of my audio tracks and all of my buses beforehand are fed into the trim track. And all this is doing is setting the level being fed into the next track, which is the mix chain. Then from there, there's one more bus before the stereo out. And the only thing that I have on this bus is a emulation of a mixing room. This is also made by Acoustica Audio and it's called Sienna. Now what this technology does is it creates a mixing environment inside a pair of headphones. And basically you just tell Sienna which pair of headphones you own and it makes a profile for you. And then you can choose which environment you wanna be put in. It has various mixing environments and a couple mastering studios. And there's some add-on studios you can get for this as well. But I just use the bass library because it gets the job done for me. And then there is one more plugin on this bus. And that is just a gain plugin that I use to switch the mix from stereo to mono. So for a lot of the mixing process, I'll actually leave this engaged so that the entire mix is folded down to mono. And as a general rule, if you can hear everything in mono, then you'll really be able to hear it when it's in stereo. And then I don't have anything at all on the stereo out. There are two reasons why I put nothing at all on the stereo out. The first is because the stereo bus utilizes the CPU in a much less efficient way than everything else. If I were to put compressors or EQs or something like this, then it taxes the CPU a lot more. The second reason is that I like to have reference tracks in my mix. So for instance, here, I have a Smith's song that I just check in on every now and then to make sure that I'm in the ballpark of where I wanna go. And this track bypasses the mix chain so that it doesn't colorize it in any way at all. And this just goes straight to my mixing environment in my headphones and then to the stereo out. All right, so let's talk about the plugins that I have in the mix chain. So the first plugin I always have on, on my mix chain is a, is a meter. And again, most if not all of the analog emulations that I use are calibrated to negative 18. It wants to see negative 18 as an average level. So I adjust the volume on the trim channel beforehand to compensate. The chorus or the outro is usually the best place to make this decision because it's usually the loudest part of the song. So as you can see, I have my trim channel set to negative five and a half, and that's feeding into the meter. Oh, but there's no trouble tonight. Whoa. So some occasional visits to the negative 16 to negative 15 area is okay, as long as it just doesn't stay there. But you really wanna see most of the volume around here between negative 19 to 17. And uh, your peak levels can go, can go as high, like I said before, as negative one before they clip. So this is feeding a good level to, to the rest of my chain. So next up, I have a summing bus plugin and this is made by Acoustica Audio, and it's from their Brown series of plugins. And I believe this is a bus emulation from a Quad 8 console. I know that in order to be true to my original plan of going the Neve SSL route, I should have probably chosen the bus emulation from the SSL. But in the end, I just liked the way that this one sounded better. That is not to say that I didn't use some SSL flavor in the mix chain. The next two plugins are emulations of an SSL bus compressor. This compressor was used on a lot of hits in the 80s, 90s, up till today. And this is one of the most widely modeled plugins out there. So you don't have to use a Nebula library like I do. There's tons out there. I know UAD makes one that's great. I think Slate Digital released one. There's a ton, but this one is cool and I really like the way it sounds. And I have it set up. So the ratio is at two to one. Uh, the threshold is completely song dependent. The attack is 30, the release is auto. And those are 
pretty much typical of the settings you would see when this is used on an entire mix. And the second plugin is an emulation of the preamp that you get in the compressor. Just the way that Nebula is set up, these two plugins had to be made separate from each other. So the amount of compression that you choose to get on your entire mix is completely taste oriented. Some people barely like to see this needle move, whereas others like to see two to four decibels of compression. That's pretty much where I fall into. And then even other guys push the compressor as hard as eight or even a tiny bit more, and then they'll dial back in some dry signal. So they'll take some wet signal and they'll take some dry signal and put them together. But on this song in particular, in the choruses, it's hitting around negative four. There's no trouble tonight. Yeah, negative two, negative four tops on this song. Now, some people might use no compression at all on their mix bus, and that's fine too. But for this song in particular, I was really looking for something that kind of stamped on the, on the mix a little bit and just glued it all together, which is what this compressor is famous for. Now, throughout the chain, I have meter plugins, just checking that I'm not overloading the signal. So after my compressor, I have a mix bus EQ. This is an emulation of the Electrodyne 511 EQ, also included in Acoustica Audio's Brown series of plugins. And usually at the beginning of a mix, I'll make a decision whether or not I wanna use a bus EQ for the entire mix. And then once that decision is made, I decide which one I wanna use. In this case, I chose this one because it adds some nice attitude on the top end and the low end, I could crank a little bit without interfering too much with the rest of the elements of the mix. So this made a really cool sounding start to the entire mix. So these decisions are made really early on in the mix. And then once in a while, I'll bypass it throughout the mix process and maybe make some small adjustments as to how much I'm adding. But starting with a little boost in the low end and a little boost in the high end, can save you from over EQing the individual elements of the mix. So after that EQ, I got another meter plugin going into another tape emulation. This tape emulation by L London Acoustics, it includes the multi-track, which is what every individual audio track would have. And then it includes the master tape, which is what the two track stereo balance has. So here I have it set to master, and the typical settings that you would see when choosing the master setting. I know I haven't talked too much about the features of this particular tape emulation. I could do a whole video on it because small adjustments on this plugin go a long way and feeding it the correct level is also really important. But once you get the workflow dialed in on this one, I think it's really one of the best sounding tape emulations on the, on the market, if not the best. And that's it, I have my summing bus emulation going into my compressor, just gluing the track together a little bit. From there, I have an overall mix EQ. It's being printed <laughs> to the master tape. And as long as the meter isn't giving me too many problems, this is when I'll print my mix for mastering. Okay, so the last thing I'll focus on for this track in particular is I wanna talk about volume automation. Now, even though you can do a great job with compression when it comes to controlling the overall level of an audio track, you're still gonna wanna get in there and move the faders around. Or in my case, you just draw in automation because I'm just using a keyboard and a mouse. So as you can see, this clean guitar part, for example, I really got in there and made some, some parts poke out and tucked some other parts back in the mix. Sometimes you even want a kick drum to stand out above the other kick drum hits. So you just punch them up a little bit and then bring it back down to an average level. As you can see here for the kick drum, I got an average level of plus one. And then on some hits, I want to accentuate them. So you bring it up five decibels. Or like I showed earlier on the vocals, sometimes you really got to get in there and deal with those S's manually. And you don't have to go crazy dealing with just minutia but just a little, little volume adjustments here and there at certain points really helps a mix come alive. 
So with that, we'll wrap up this video. In the next and final installment in this debut creative series, we'll take a brief look at the mastering process that went into this song. I really hope that you've gotten something useful out of watching this video. And if you did, then please give the channel a like and subscribe for more stuff. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next time.